Hi, right, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Garrett Van Hoy. I uh, work for Periton Labs. I've been part of this uh, community. I uh, learned a lot um, through GNU Radio about software-defined radio, signal processing. Uh, so I'm very thankful to be uh, at this conference and part of this community as well. Uh, so today I'm going to give a brief update on uh, this Python package that uh, we introduced last year at the GNU Radio conference. Uh, we had a presentation on it and also a workshop, and I was uh, presently surprised to see the kind of interest uh, that people had in it. Uh, that workshop was very full at that time. Um, but this is, a, this is a package that's kind of a, a blend of RF signal processing and machine learning. Um, and if you've been going to the GNU Radio conference for a few years, you'll notice there's been in the past a lot of actually presentations on uh, machine learning. So this is, even though this is not specifically like in GNU Radio, there's a lot of different ways that machine learning uh, can be integrated into GNU Radio um, and used for a lot of uh, wireless applications, uh, which I will talk about today. So uh, that's how this is related to GNU Radio. Um, so I just wanted to provide an update of where this has gone in the last year. Uh, we just kind of open sourced it uh, like pretty much right before the conference last year and wh where has it gone and what, what updates there are to it until then. Um, and personally, you know, as a, uh, even though I've been contributing a little bit here and there to GNU Radio, um, definitely trying to maintain a piece of software like this is a new experience to me. So I'm, I have a new appreciation for what GNU Radio has been able to do as a project. It is not easy to uh, maintain uh, a piece of software like this that is used by such a large community and also a very core part of a lot of projects, both research and commercial as well. So uh, this presentation may not be as visual as some of the others, so if you're interested uh, in this topic, uh, please note that a lot of the pictures, a lot of the figures, and a lot of the code, the code you can find is on GitHub. I'm specifically referring to things that you will find on, on a branch on there that will be merged into the main branch soon. Uh, but also, there are two papers that we presented last year that uh, I will kind of briefly refer to what those results were if you want to know about uh, some of the data sets that we actually talk about uh, today. Okay? So, um, so I'm going to give just a brief overview of what is TorchSig in case you haven't heard of it, uh, what is this about, why, why am I talking about it, and then some of uh, what's actually new. Okay? So what is TorchSig? One of the things that it is, it's a collection of highly parameterized uh, synthetic RF data sets. Uh, this can serve uh, a number of purposes, but one of the big motivations of making this was actually uh, being able to establish uh, some kind of RFML community-wide benchmark, right? We, uh, there have been uh, various different RFML data sets that came out from like uh, late, like maybe 2016 uh, onward, uh, but what we found when we were trying to prototype new networks on it and different algorithms on it, you couldn't actually show any improvement using those same data sets. So those data sets didn't provide the, the differentiation that we needed to be able to say, okay, our new network, our new layer, our new learning approach is better at all. So trying to make these kinds of data sets where people could see transparently how was this generated, uh, how could it be improved, things like this. This was one of the big motivational factors of, of making uh, TorchSig and the data sets in there. And also just creating toy data sets. Like if you want to be able to show um, and also share your results in the, in the research community, you need to be able to, or it's very helpful to be able to create, you know, just a BPSK, QPSK data set with a certain set of impairments. Because a lot of the results I had seen up to then, um, you know, there would be a paper saying, hey, these are great techniques, but when you add this specific channel impairment, they don't work, so here is a way around that, right? So we wanted to make it so that, you know, testing that and demonstrating that uh, while keeping all of these other assumptions intact, that was a big part of what we wanted to do. So it's a lot of it is about being able to just provide an easy way to get access or to have these highly parameterized data sets, which are, uh, very helpful for ML research, because we saw this in the, the CV community, the computer vision community, having these kinds of data sets like ImageNet that allow people to uh, just share their results very easily and demonstrate like this is making this much progress and being able to compare, we wanted to bring that into the RF community. Another big thing is actually having a suite of 
RF and ML domain transforms, and those serve many different purposes, but one of them is channel modeling. Uh, channel modeling allows you to train on something that is closer and closer to realism as, as much as you can, or as much as it's useful for machine learning and also data augmentation if you've uh, done any research in RFML. Yes, there may be an abundance of data that you can collect using an SDR, but can you simulate that same data going through any number of RF channels? A lot of the times using synthetic transforms to emulate this kind of channel is very helpful, both for training, for validation, for a variety of different reasons. So that suite of transforms there is where we think the most val or a, a good chunk of the value of TorchSig comes in. Uh, and trying to bring in the, trying to bring in some of the state of the art um, Progress has been actually already achieved in the ML community because they have these networks and they, these, uh, these deep learning networks actually work not just on one domain, but they work across several domains. So trying to bring that network into the RF domain so that we can at least use that as a baseline and say if we're going to improve, probably it should start from here in some way, right? So that was another thing. And then utilities for bringing in your own data set, right? If you can't bring in your own data set, it's not, not all that helpful. Okay, so when we were making it, uh, the, the big things that we wanted to try to do is try to resemble as much as possible these Torch Vision, uh, Torch Audio kind of APIs so that those that were familiar with actually doing machine learning research in those communities could come and also play along and try to show it if their, you know, their network actually is better. It actually would also presumably be better in the RF domain even if it is designed and thought about in some other domain. Okay, try not to focus on a specific ML framework. So uh, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch are two big ones, but there's others out there that we didn't want to force people to use. Make it easy to use new data sets. Uh, make it easy to bring in your own impairments because if you don't think that the uh, channel model is of a sufficient quality, make it easy so that you can write your own uh, that kind of models whatever radio that you're, you're dealing with at the time and provide as many examples as we can to be able to show you how to use the framework. Okay, so the, if you actually look at the package, this is what you'll see if you, if you see it on GitHub. There's a few things that have been added since uh, we introduced this a year ago. Um, but again, a big part of it is still the data sets, and there's a lot of structure under there about how those data sets get generated. Uh, we've added a lot more examples and scripts. So because we've run, uh, in collaborating with other groups of people, we found there are plenty of people like, that's great, you have a cool library, just give me the data. I already have what I need at this point. So uh, we kind of made these scripts to where we can generate uh, static versions of the data sets that we talk about uh, so that people can just look at the data, see if it really fits what they're expecting, and try their own algorithms on it without needing to use uh, almost any of the rest of the library at all. There's a few models that we support in there. Efficient Net and uh, Exit are two kind of popular baseline networks that demonstrate two different uh, kinds of networks in the computer vision community as well. So we support at least just showing how to use those things, but there are many more models out there. There are many more variations on these models, but we have them there to show you that our intention is for you to use it with things like this. Um, lots of transforms, it's a huge list there, and that actually is not even a, a complete list of what kind of transforms are in this library, but uh, just to show you so, some of the ones in there, you see things like target SNR and add noise. These things are related to RF channels impairments, but there are other things like time reversal, which you might ask, like, why do you have something like time reversal? Well, that's not like an impairment. If you could, you know, make that happen in reality, that would be cool, but it's actually there because it helps with machine learning, right? It's actually a common augmentation for other other kinds of uh, other kinds of machine learning, and it actually turns out to be helpful in learning even in the RF world as well. Okay, and there's other, also some utilities. Okay, so what's what's new? Where where have we tried to go with this uh, from the time of its release? Try to make it more usable. At first, it was a, I would say it would be at least usable by somebody who's interested in doing research in that domain, has some time to to actually look at the code, has some time. Um, you know, that it's worth their time rather than doing everything from scratch to look at the code and try to make it work for them. But trying to get it to work off the shelf may be a little difficult in the, in the form that it was in. There were certainly some examples that worked off the shelf, but uh, not, not as extensive uh, as you would hope if you just wanted to play around with it. So trying to go more in that direction is what uh, we spent some time to do in the last year. So what that's looked like, uh, actually this is an exception to that. 
we did actually release the, the wideband SIG53 data set, so I'm not going to go over what the SIG53 data set is. That's one of the things that we introduced last year. But we introduced a wideband version of that data set. So the wideband version of that data set is significantly more substantial. Uh, the SIG53 data set kind of emulates you knew where the signal was, you knew about what bandwidth it was, and you knew about how long it was on, and you captured it just perfectly like that. Uh, but the wideband SIG53 data set is now imagine you're just a radio receiving stuff and all these SIG53 signals could just appear anywhere in that spectrum. They could, each of those signals that, even though there might be multiple of them in that spectrogram, imagine that they all go through their own independent channel and then they all go through one uh, not independent channel, right? The receiver affects all of those signals all at once. So that, that data set is there, and there's quite a lot of structure to it underneath. Um, but these, this data set, the way we set it up, is to be able to train a network to do semantic segmentation, instant segmentation, or object detection, specifically draw boxes in a spectrogram, right? We want to be able to time frequency localize. So the, the data set is certainly set up for that, but you could use it for all different kinds of things. You just have to change what the labels are, right? If you wanted to just make a detector for a specific kind of signal, instead of drawing boxes, you change the label to is the signal there or not, it becomes a, a two-class problem. So we spent a lot of time on that one, and the results that we have for that data set are also uh, there, there in that paper. That paper was something we also mentioned last year. So the, just to mention very briefly what the structure of that is underneath, we wanted to make this uh, library so that it would be easy for people to add on to it, to expand it, easy as possible. Right? It's not going to be that easy, but the way the data set works is that in the wideband data set, you basically, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, in the in the wideband data set underneath, what it does is that you define a burst source, right? So you would think of some other transmitter, it's emitting bursts that are all of a similar-ish type. And so if you can define a burst source, then you can actually plug into this wideband data set and you can include your own transmitter, right, in this new data set as long as you can get that class to produce a burst of certain specifications that are on for a certain amount, bandwidths a certain amount, things like this, then uh, you can also kind of use uh, this data set for your own purposes in that way as well. Okay, so some of the things that we spent some time on is accelerating the data set generation. Because RF data, it can get very large and take up a lot of disk space. Um, we thought that it would be good to have an option to generate it on, on your machine, but uh, SIG53 is like 70 gigabytes, wideband SIG53 is, I believe, several terabytes, so not everyone's machine has that amount. Uh, but, and also, trans uh, and also allowing it to be downloadable is a little bit difficult. So we just accelerated uh, generating both of these. Um, depends on what kind of machine that you originally generated on, but just generally speaking, we reduced uh, the amount of time it takes to generate SIG53 down to a couple of hours. And wideband SIG53, which used to require GPU acceleration to even get it to be generated in less than a month, now you don't need a GPU and it should still take like at most a day or two to be able to generate that whole data set. And we did that by use doing better DSP. Uh, there was a, a few, few lines of code that kind of are always the culprits in these things. You know, doing uh, doing frequency domain filtering instead of time domain at the right time, and also doing multi-threading, which um, we kind of got for free using PyTorch stuff. Okay. So other things that we added on there is now there are scripts for generating the data sets. I mentioned this earlier. If you don't want to know anything else about TorchSig, if you just want a data set to see what the signals are like and be able to play with machine learning, uh, there are some scripts there that are now included to be able to generate both of these data sets on your machine. Uh, and different sizes of them. So if you just want to see an example of what those data sets look like, you can now do that. And if it's convenient for you, if you're familiar with Docker and Docker is easier for you to install, um, then we also have some options to use Docker and simplified it so that you can actually just, uh, we made it so that if you can generate these data, uh, generate these data sets, we provide a class also so that you can just use that class only in like a notebook and then just view what comes out of it without, again, using the rest of the library if you'd like. Okay, other things that we added is there's some examples for generating and analyzing either a static version of these data sets or an on the fly. 
SIG53 and these other data sets, they can be generated on the fly, and then you can train on them on the fly, so you can have as many samples as you want because it's, it, it is randomly generated. Um, it's just much slower when you do that on the fly because you have to generate it on the fly. But when you can read it from disk, it's much faster. There's also some examples of using different visualizations for time domain, frequency domain, uh, even constellation plots so that you can see what are you training on. That's always very important. Before you train on something, you know what you're training on. Okay. Other general improvements that we have is we've updated the documentation, uh, done a lot of refactoring underneath so that that documentation can also be more understandable itself. Uh, adjusted some of the structure that's in there, and we added tests because there actually weren't tests when we originally uh, released this at all. Uh, it's not so easy to test, uh, especially numerical stuff like this, but uh, the best thing that we could do is now every time we give a release, now figures will come with that so you can see if those figures change from one major version to another. Uh, benchmarking and hashing the name data sets so that we know if they've actually fundamentally changed or not as well. Okay. Um, there is still activity on this. You know, it, it, it's only a couple of people that are actively, I would say, monitoring this, this specific project and repository. Um, I says 60 commits there, but that is squashing of many, many other commits underneath. Um, so if you have issues that you put on there, at least there's been response within about a week. Um, so it is a, an active repository in that regard. And if you're curious as to where the project is going, there is actually a GitHub project that you can view um, and see what's going on there. Okay. So in the future, things that we're hoping to, uh, to work on, uh, obviously pull requests are always welcome, uh, but trying to make it so that we can wrap some of the custom data sets, like in the last three, three, four years especially, a lot of custom data sets are out there. They may be behind different kind of accesses. I think a lot of IEEE stuff, you have to at least be a member to get those. But even just having the class that if you have access to that data set, just making it so that you can actively use something like that is something that we would hope hope to get in there. Better transforms to, to emulate more sophisticated channel models I don't think is, is a, that far away to, to be able to do that. And showing canonical examples of different RFML tasks. So we have classification and some object detection and things like this, but there are many other RFML tasks that we uh, foresee being able to put in there saying, hey, you know, this is how you would try to use RFML to do this maybe classic DSP thing. Okay. That's all I have for the presentation, and thank you guys for listening.